All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo, some seagull challenger today. We put the top hatch together in the last video. This time we're going to start with the tail feathers. Let's see how far we can get. First job, another dry fit to make sure it all goes together properly. The tail plane slots in nicely and the fin in the top slot. The rudder looks good. All the lines line up without too much of a gap and the elevators look good too. Right. The hinge edges are currently square, which really isn't any good. We need to bevel them so the rudder can move. There's a couple of methods. The side hinge, usually used on park flyers with a tape hinge. The single bevel, which is how Seagull did the ailerons. I tend to bevel both parts. This gives the most freedom of movement. Actually, if you do a 90 degree bevel, you get way more movement than needed. But it guarantees there won't be any binding. Cutting the bevel is easiest with a blade on a jig, but I don't have such a jig, so I measure the surface thickness, in this case 8mm, halve it to 4mm and mark from the edge to be beveled on both sides. Then some marks on the edge itself. Join the dots with a pencil and a ruler and you should be left with a nice set of guidelines. Run a sanding block over it, going just to the lines. You should end up with a perfectly beveled edge. Nice. <laughs> The assembly isn't quite finished though, the edges will need rounding off, but that's a really dusty job, so I'm going to do that outside. Now we can rinse and repeat on all the other hinged edges. Here's the rudder completely beveled. Tidy. <laughs> the tailplane will need to be beveled too, but first, while the trailing edge is nice and straight, we can use it to get the centre line. If we measure the width at the trailing edge, halve it and make a mark, then use a square and mark the centre line. This is useful to get the rough position when we come to fitting the tailplane to the fuselage. With it slotted in, the line can be lined up in the slot. The elevators need to get a bevel on the hinge line, and the outside edges need to be rounded off. Same with the tailplane. A little while later, we have this little pile of bits, all nice and smooth, all rounded off. I've also hinged the tailplane and one of the elevators. These Kavan hinges just slide in. Nice. <laughs> Here's the other elevator. Making the slots is really easy with the right tools. I'm using a cheaper nasty hinge slotting kit. Something similar should be available at all good model shops. Right, take the fork tool that's closest to the hinge size, but without being smaller. Press it into the edge you want the slot in, keeping it central and straight. Keep pressing and wobble it a bit side to side. When you're up to the end of the fork bit, remove the tool. Then take the tool with the hooked end and dig out the balsa left in the middle. When it's all clear, the hinge should slide in neatly. One more thing though, the hinge has a bulge in the middle, so we need to trim a little balsa out for clearance. Just a sliver from the top and bottom edge. Then when the hinge goes back in, the hinge line can sit neatly at the peak of the bevel. There we go then, one hinged tailplane. Only problem is, the elevators are quite independent. This is where the joiner comes in. It will go between the elevators, tying them together. It's one of those bits that needs a bit of attention to get it in just the right spot. It's quite easy to end up with the elevators not quite in line. Lay the tailplane on a flat surface and position the elevators so there's a little bit of clearance each end. Hold the joiner over the elevators as central as you can. On this kit there's a laser cut mark which is very nearly spot on. I found the joiner wanted to be very slightly inside of the mark. We need to drill a hole into the edge of the elevator. So to help keep the drill bit central I'm cutting a flat spot in the bevel. Next we need to work out roughly how deep we need to drill. Looks like it's somewhere around here. It doesn't matter too much if you end up a bit deeper than needed. The void will get filled with the excess glue later. To keep the hole nice and straight, start with a small bit and work up. The final drill size wants to be just a little bit bigger than the diameter of the joiner. Just 0.1 or 0.2 millimeters oversize. This gives us a little bit of wiggle room with the final alignment. The joiner wants to fit so it's on the hinge line. So we'll need to trim out a little bit of balsa. Two cuts to make a V slot will do just fine. You can see the joiner now fits nicely into the elevator. The same steps can be done with the other elevator. You should end up with an assembly like this. Now, because the joiner is on the hinge line, it will need to have a little slot in the tailplane too. Mark up where the joiner comes on the beveled edge and just like the elevators, cut a little V groove in the edge. When we get to the covering, it will allow the joiner to move without binding. 
pop all the hinges in and check everything lines up nicely. If it doesn't, you might need to tweak the bends in the joiner a bit. In my case though, it was close enough. <laughs> Get a good flat surface lined up. I'm using some glass that I know is nice and flat. We need some epoxy to stick the joiner in. Go for at least one hour, but two hours is better. Mix up a batch, making sure you've got more than you need, and put it onto one side. Now the fun bit. Take the elevators off the tailplane and remove the joiner. Keep track of which way around everything goes. Use a cocktail stick to get the epoxy into the hole. Really work it in. You don't need to fill it up, just make sure the walls have a nice generous coating. Run some along the groove too. And now slowly press the joiner in. Don't go too fast or you'll blow a hole through the balsa, making a right sticky mess. Fill up the hole in the other elevator and the groove and join the two elevators together. Again, press the joiner in slowly. Wrap the assembly in some cling film and press it up to the tailplane. It might be easier with the hinges removed. Carefully make 100% sure everything is perfectly positioned. A little bit of clearance at each end and a perfect alignment between the beveled edges. When it's all just right, put some weight on the top and leave it to completely harden. An easy way to check is by checking the leftover epoxy. Once it's completely solid, you can remove the weight and inspect your work. If you look down the trailing edge, you shouldn't see any twist. If you do, well, good luck trying to straighten it. That's why we spent so long getting everything ready. <laughs> With the hinges in, we can see it's all as close to perfect as it can be. Nice. If you take your time with the build, making sure it's all going to fit before gluing any bits together, it really makes it go together a lot smoother. Um, servo next, I think? For this model, we need a total of five. You could use some mini servos and modify the mounts, even something like an HS85 for the throttle. But on a model like this, I would just stick with the good old HS311. Not particularly torquey or fast, but plenty good enough for this. On a 6L receiver pack, they, they do quite well. All the servos come with an accessory pack. We need to fit the rubber grommets to all the servos and the brass ferrules. This helps isolate against vibration. Without them, the lugs will crack over time, leading to some fairly major problems in flight. Where the servos fit, they need some holes drilled for the mounting screws. Currently, there's only the thin bit of ply for the screws to bite into. It's probably good enough, but I'm going to glue some extra strips to double it up. It's easiest to show on the wing, I reckon. I've cut these strips of plywood, which will go on the inside of the servo hole, held in with a couple of drops of thin sino. A simple little tweak, but will make the mounting far more positive. The servos come with these screws screws with some sort of cross point head that fits no screwdriver. Rather than mess about with them, I'm going to be using these neat little Allen head servo screws. Roughly the same size, but so much easier to get in and out. Now the sino has dried, we can drill the holes. For these screws, a 1.5mm bit does the job. A little small, but the screws will really grip the wood. The Allen heads will let you get the torque to cut the threads. This is a really simple technique for getting all those holes in just the right place. The first hole is the most critical. Hold the servo in the perfect position and drill one of the holes through the ferrule. Then pop a screw in. You only need to do a couple of turns. Next, drill the hole in the opposite corner, making sure the servo is nice and straight. Now pop in a screw and those two screws will now hold the servo in position while you drill the last two holes. Really easy to do, and you end up with a perfectly positioned servo. OK, remove the screws and the servo. Run the drill bit through the holes again and make sure they're nice and clear. Then use a screw to cut the threads in each of the holes. Do the screw up until it's fully sticking out the bottom, then remove it. When you've done all four, put a spot of thin sino on each of the holes. It will soak into the threads, making them good and strong. The other wing and the three servos in the fuselage need the same treatment and it should end up looking something like this. I reckon we've probably got time for a couple more steps yet, so let's have a look at the engine mount. I've got a good old OS52 to go in, which is a little loose in the mount. I would have changed the mount to one that's a bit of a better fit, but since the firewall was pre-fitted for this one, I figure we can make it work. There's still a fair amount of meat for the screws to tap into, so I think we'll get away with it just fine. 
Since it's quite loose, getting the engine to stay central can be a bit of an issue. We could do some measurements and calculate things, but I found a couple of bits of balsa that are just the right thickness to wedge in either side of the crankcase. In theory, that should keep the engine in the right spot. I think it's worth a shot anyway. With the wedges in, wrap the engine with a rubber band to hold it tight to the mount. Position the engine so there's some clearance around the carburetor, and make sure the throttle arm is free to move. On a two-stroke, make sure there's a gap between the back plate and the screw heads. If you're running electric, there's a plywood mounting box in the kit that fits in place of the engine mount. When you've got it in just the right place, use a drill bit that just fits in the holes in the engine lugs, and while firmly pressing it to the mount, turn it by hand a couple of times. It might be tempting to start making all full holes, but just like the servos, doing it one at a time will guarantee the positions. Here you can just about see the mark if I get the light on it just right. Best practice is to use a punch on the mark so the drill doesn't wander, then put the mount in a machine vise with the top surface of the lug flush with the top of the drawers, then use a pillar drill to drill all the way through. If you don't have machine tools, take your time and keep the drill straight. When the hole's been drilled, pop the engine back on the mount and screw in one of the self-tappers with a large washer. Do it up until it's just snug to the engine lug. Pop the balsa wedge back in and mark the hole opposite to the one we just did. Same as before, use a drill bit that just fits in the hole and give it a couple of twists by hand. Remove the screw, remove the engine, punch the mark and drill the hole. <laughs> the engine can go back onto the mount now. Fit both the screws with holes with their washers. Do them up so they're just snug to the lugs. The engine shouldn't be able to move about now, so we can mark the two remaining holes, punch them and drill them. The big thing with all this is not to attempt to drill all the holes with the engine in place. First, you risk getting bits inside the engine. Second, you risk damaging the engine with the drill chuck, especially a problem with a side exhaust on a two-stroke. And of course, running a hard steel drill inside the aluminium lugs is just asking for trouble. Let's get it fitted to the firewall. Under the screw heads, there's a split washer and a plane washer. At this stage, I'm only going to do them up just enough so the engine mount is held to the firewall. There's no point in squashing the split washers. Strictly speaking, they're actually a single-use item, but I don't think anyone is actually that strict with them, though. <laughs> Everything looks to be lined up okay. Maybe just slightly off straight, but it's close enough for me. The throttle arm moves nicely. Nice. Does show up a problem that we'll tackle in a bit, though. The throttle arm is in line with the engine mount. We'll make it tricky to run a linkage to the throttle servo. Should be fun. OK, time for one more bit, I think. The engine mount can come off again, which presents us with this big hole in the firewall. The round hole is OK, but the extra rectangular hole for the build jig is a little unsightly. We're not looking to add strength, but I think blocking it up will look a little bit neater. I've cut a block of scrap balsa, which is a snug fit in the hole. I'm going to pop it in and use something flat to make it flush, then drop some thick cyano around the edges. Simple, and I think it does look a little bit neater. Right, fuel proofing. <laughs> First, the hole for the mounting pin on the latch needs to be blocked. A square bit of sticky backed address label will do the job nicely. Just enough to cover the hole. Now, the whole of the front will end up being covered in covering film, which of course is fuel proof. But as a model ages, the film will see some damage, might peel a bit, so it's best practice to soak something into the wood to block the fuel and oil. I always used to use a good old dope and fuel proofer, but it takes a long time to dry. Several days normally. So these days, I and most other people use a thin resin. You can use a normal one hour epoxy with some resin thinner, or if you play with fiberglass and have some thin glassing resin, you can use that neat. Mix up a good amount and start applying it with a disposable brush. Apply a small amount at a time. You'll see it soak into the wood, it will darken, and after a minute start to look a bit rough where the grain lifts. When you have too much, you'll start to see glossy pools of resin. Just work the brush over them until it's all an even rough finish. You want to coat the inside of the cheeks, the edges of the cheeks, and around the outside edge. The outside of the firewall, around the holes, and what you can get to on the inside of the firewall. Be careful not to fill up the threads on the T-nuts. If you're not overloading the brush, you shouldn't have a problem. You can also work a bit around the undercarriage holes, the hatch mount screw holes, and the pressure rod exits. Just a little bit. 
That lot's going to take a good while to harden up. The stuff I've used takes a good 12 hours. So I think here's a good place to end the video for this week. Thanks for watching. I do hope you enjoyed. If you did, by all means hit that like button. And of course, if you're not already, why not subscribe? It's free after all. <laughs> Bye guys. Bye.